quickly give you an overview of what we're going to uh, cover tonight. This is our monthly um, Black Force Recovery Update of our Long Range Recovery Committee. I'm going to start off with some brief um, remarks with, with, with regard to the fact that we're moving into a, a, a different phase in the recovery process. And then we, we've been fortunate enough to have our, our county assessor is going to provide us some information. So I'm going to put him on the, the agenda first and let him give his update. Uh, and then we will move into our reports. And I'm actually, if you, I don't know if you have a copy of the agenda, I'm going to allow State Senator Lambert to give his report here first so that we are respectful of his time because I know he might have a prior engagement. So, so with that, um, we are now what we consider from the county standpoint moving into phase two. And what that means is you're going to start seeing um, less county sponsored meetings. We are still going to traditionally have, um, there might be mentor connections, United Policyholder type meetings. But as far as the subcommittees, the subcommittees are essentially going to meet on an as needed basis uh, where really the county is, is going to put, pull back and, and really go back into the role that we traditionally had prior to the fire where uh, a lot of information is going to flow through me as the resident commissioner and if there are um, support requests we'll, we'll actually try to, to work those at a staff level. Uh, we will still have a, a monthly recovery meeting and as you're going to see tonight most of those meetings are going to be report outs from our staff with regard to the different recovery related activities that are occurring out in the field, whether it be from regional building, uh, whether it's from our, our parks department, uh, on down the line. So we do have a couple of presenters that are set up, so you'll be able to see the flow of the process of these new meetings. Um, then halfway through the meeting, we will also have a time for any nonprofits that are in the community that we're working with, whether it's Black Force Together, Crosses for Losses, whatever, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to address the committee and identify to us whether or not they need any county-related support. Uh, just to give you some quick insight, we did have a, a visit from our FEMA uh, liaison, and basically what the, the guidance that we received is we're, we have a working relationship with FEMA, but they want to make sure that we also have a relationship with our recovery groups that are in the community, whether they're nonprofits or whatever. And they first want to make sure that the county is providing all the support and services that we can provide under our statutory obligation. But they also want to make sure that there's a recovery support network of community volunteers, faith-based organizations, you name it, that are able to work with the community and deal with those needs without the assistance of, you know, essentially the, the county government. And then allow those people to go off and transition back into what we're calling the, the new normal. So um, that's kind of what's happening from an overview standpoint. So uh, the number of monthly meetings will drop off, but we will have a monthly long range recovery meeting until a, a year out from the fire. That is the plan to keep that going. So with that, I would like to uh, ask our uh, County Assessor Mark Loudman to give us a, a real quick update. And again, I want to thank you for coming out and, uh, and, and being willing to do that. Glad to help. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, good evening. Uh, Commissioners, uh, Littleton and Glenn asked me to attend the, the mentors meeting last night out at the Pinery. And I think I'll kind of give uh, you the same overview and presentation of what my office has done and what we're going to do. Uh, what we're finding is that it's been a little bit, sir? I'm sorry, I think the mic is worse than your good voice. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, much better. Okay. okay. Um, I think what has happened, or what we're seeing in my office, uh, is that there's been a little bit of time passed since the fire, and for a lot of people, the initial shock of uh, damage and destruction has passed, and now we're starting to get some nut and bolt questions about what happens with this and what happens with that. And this evening, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we've done with property values, uh, what we can do in the future if there are additional changes, 
and some impacts to your property taxes if your property was either damaged or destroyed. So, uh, to start off, we got in, we being uh, my appraisal staff, got into the Black Forest a week after the fire, the Tuesday following the fire. And we inspected about 2,400 properties. Uh, we identified those with that by that aerial photography that everybody I think has seen with the infrared image of where it got hot and so forth. So we used that as a baseline and increased the, the border around that and personally visited every parcel in there and documented whether the house was destroyed or damaged, whether the trees were destroyed or damaged. Uh, same thing for the outbuildings, uh, sheds, barns, detached garages, what have you. Uh, and that's one of the things that separated this fire so much from Mountain Shadows. Uh, Mountain Shadows compared to Black Forest was a piece of cake. Uh, it was all condensed in a neighborhood and that process of inspecting all those parcels uh, took us a couple of days. Uh, I anticipated it was going to take us a month or a month and a half out in the forest and surprisingly my guys got it done in not quite three weeks. So what we did then was transfer all of that data into our internal database, uh, making note of what was damaged and, and destroyed and so forth. So the next step is to, for our office, is to estimate that, that diminution of value because of the damage and destruction. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy uh, and is, I think last night I called it uh, something like sticker shock when you get your tax bill in January. And the reason for that is because statutorily, Assessors must prorate a demolished property from the date of the event. So let's say you've got a house uh, that was destroyed, the trees are fine, your house and lot stay on at 100% of the taxable value up until June 11th. At that point, the, the structure, the house, goes to zero for the remaining 203 days of the year and the land stays the same. So. And, and we ran into this a little bit at Waldo Canyon, uh, so I'm trying to kind of forewarn folks in the forest that you will get a tax bill that will have some value on your structures that were destroyed. Um, and I'll take questions after this if anybody's got anything specific. But the other thing that differentiated Black Forest from uh, Waldo Canyon and Mountain Shadows was the loss and damage to trees. We're fortunate that we've, we being my office again, that we've got excellent historical data on what the market will bear for a lot that has trees as a, a lot that does not. And it's about 30%. So if your property was subject to uh, an area where the fire crowned and got up into the tops of the trees, and you just got a bunch of black sticks there, uh, you've got a 30% reduction to your land value in addition any structure damage. It's a little fuzzier on the, uh, the properties that had trees that were just damaged. And in talking to folks, there's a, there's a chance they might make it, they might not. So given the fact that we assume that if you've got a bunch of black trees, but they might make it, there's still going to be some reduction in value if you try to sell your property. We reduced those lots by 15%. Now we're going to keep an eye on those. and. If some of the trees make it on some of the lots, we'll deal with the value then, but if those trees subsequently fail and don't make it, we'll further adjust that value down. And that reduction in value is prorated also. So when I say 30% reduction to the land value, it won't be 30% on the tax bill that you get in January. It'll be a prorated value. So that brings up the next question that we've been getting, is what happens in 2014? And there's a couple of things, and they have an impact on your, your bottom line on your tax bill, so we'll go over those. The first thing is, if your structure burnt down, if your residence burnt down, I want to assure you that we're not going to change the assessment rate. And if you're not familiar with that, there are two in Colorado. There's a residential assessment rate and a non-residential assessment rate. And the assessment rate is simply the multiplier that takes you from the market value that's on the tax rolls 
to the taxable value of your property. Now, if you've got a house on there, that assessment rate is just under 8%, 7.96%. Conversely, if you've got a piece of vacant land, it's 29%. What we're not going to do is penalize the property owners that have uh, been devastated by a fire by taking their house off and immediately raising the assessment rate to 29% on the lot. Uh, we're going to leave those in place at least two years and see what's happening in the forest at that time, maybe longer. So, and, and that's been a big question. It happened, uh, that same scenario happened oh, three or four years ago up in Boulder, and there was a high-end subdivision west of town, uh, hillside lots, very expensive homes, very expensive lots, and there was destruction much like in parts of the forest where residences were lost and all the trees were lost. And the assessor up there responded by increasing the value of the lots because now the view's better because they didn't have any trees, and then he put 29% assessment rate on We're not going to do that. <laughs> Frankly, I'm surprised he's still alive. Where does he, <laughs> where does he work now? Uh, he, he's, believe it or not, he's still in the system. Uh, there, there's a national publication called, believe it or not, Fair and Equitable that all assessors get. And my counterpart up in Boulder was so proud of what he did, he authored an article that went out in that national publication. So, uh, But if you, and I've talked to some people that just assume that if they hadn't started to rebuild their house by January 1st, that assessment rate was going to go up, and that's false. It's simply not. So what happens if you have not started to rebuild by January 1st of 2014, but sometime during that calendar year, start the process of rebuilding your home? In Colorado, the assessment date is January 1st of each year. So you're assessed for the entire year on what's there on the 1st of January. So if you take out a building permit on January 15th and start your house and finish it sometime during 2014, you're still only assessed and taxed on your vacant lot. So you actually kind of have a year, an additional year, before you get the full effect of your new house on your tax bill. So if you've completed your house in 2014, it'll go on the tax roll for January 1st of 2015, and you'll get the tax bill in January of 2016. Does that make sense? Every, every state has a convoluted tax system. Ours is one of the finest. <laughs> so that's kind of an overview. Uh, we've got a few minutes if it's all right with Absolutely. Commissioner Glenn, and I'll be glad to answer any questions if anybody has any. This is an opportunity to ask him because he will be leaving. So if you have any questions for him, please feel free to uh, ask away. Sir. Come on somebody, up, we have a microphone here. No, I'll, I'll just yell. <laughs> if somebody takes out a building permit before January 1, is there and starts building now? Is, is that maybe why people are not running down to get building permits? Well, uh, to an and that's a good question. To answer it, um, I'll kind of give you the scenario of what we will do. Oh, the uh, question was, what happens if I start to rebuild my house before January 1st? of 2014. So we go back to that scenario I just outlined where the assessment date is January 1st. So if you start your new residence and it's 10% complete on January 1st of next year, the way we do new construction is we estimate the contributory value of that residence and then back off 90%. So 10% of the taxable value will go on for 2013 in addition to the land and whatever adjustment we had to make for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Senator Lamb? Actually, I actually have a question. Are we, are we on mic? No, it doesn't work. They, okay. said, they said it sounded better with Delta mic. But they can pick that up on the recording. Can you pick that up on the recording? They're sitting next to me. Oh, okay. I have a live mic. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. I haven't seen you for a while, Mark. Yeah, I haven't seen you. See you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Painter probably talked to you about some questions. But one thing as a as follow-up to that, I think came up as a legitimate question was, uh, do you as an assessor or do other assessors in the state need any legislative relief to make, let's say, local decisions uh, in these emergency conditions? Because this is non-standard. If you do, um, I think that will probably require um, a discussion between the county assessors through the association and maybe through Colorado Counties Incorporated. But uh, we're ready to 
you know, listen as soon as those discussions are uh, filtered through the, you know, the, the county lobbying channels and uh, be glad to help with that. Well, and if there is anything. <laughs> uh, that's good of you to note because I think we're going to bend your ear. Uh, it came up, I was in a conference call with the northern counties that were heavily impacted by the flooding and something came up that I basically ignored. I think some of the other assessors have ignored. Statutorily, we are only supposed to prorate a damaged residence if it's not damaged but destroyed. So let's say your home uh, was affected by fire, was damaged what we estimated 50 or 75 percent. You're still displaced, but the state suggests, no, you don't change that value. You leave it at full value till the end of the year and then catch up with it in 2014, and that's just not right. Uh, the folks that had houses that were heavily damaged but not completely destroyed were just as displaced as the people who lost their homes. So we may, uh, like I say, that came up between several assessors on the flooding issues, and Joanne Groff's suggestion was maybe we do run some legislation. But, but in the meantime, we're already doing it. So. It's like we're ready to listen. <laughs> and let me just run one other thing um, that I mentioned last night. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about what the, the ongoing, let's say in the next year or two, uh, impact of the fire is going to be on property values, and the short answer is it's too early to tell. The, the effect of a fire on properties that are not damaged is referred to as stigma. There's buyer resistance for any number of reasons, because there could be another fire, because insurance rates have gone through the ceiling, whatever. Uh, I'll tell you where we're at so far on that, uh, and we'll go back to Mountain Shadows and Waldo Canyon. We've tracked the sales now in Mountain Shadows uh, for a little bit over a year. And the ones that we're seeing the most of are the people that elected not to rebuild and sold their lots. What was expected, and not we kind of expected it in my office, but I think the owners up there expected it more, is folks were going to fire sale those lots and give them away just to move on with their lives. Or builders were going to come in and try and prey upon these people that wanted to do that and pay something less than market value for those vacant lots. That has not been the case in Mountain Shadows. The lots that have sold uh, on properties where the house was destroyed have sold at pre-fire market value prices. So in that scenario, there hasn't been, at least yet, after a little over a year, any stigma associated with that fire. But those were cleaned up, right? They, yeah. They weren't larger properties. They were, they were subdivided residential lots, right. To answer that question about what's going to happen in Black Forest, um, like I say, it's too early to tell. We're going to go through the same process and monitor sales on a monthly basis and look for trends where uh, there's either a diminution in value to the lots or properties that were not damaged but are proximate to the fire, things like that. Uh, I brought a list with me last night. I didn't bring it tonight, but uh, in preparation for last, last night's meeting, last Thursday, I ran a list of every residential and vacant land sale in Black Forest since the date of the fire up through last Thursday. There have been 48. Uh, none of those properties, well, other than one, had a, a shed burn down. None of those properties had any damage to the residents or to the trees. And out of 48 sales, there was only one that the sale price was less than the market value being carried on the tax rolls. Now, it, it's fairly soon after the fire to say that that indicates there's no stigma, but at least there have been 48 sales that have not been below the market value of the tax rolls. So, you know, it's kind of early to say there's not going to be any stigma associated with an undamaged property after the fire, but 48 sales all above. Uh, the tax roll values is a pretty good sign. So what was it like in the month before the fire? Did you run a similar list to see if... We did, but we've segregated it, and for the meeting last night, I just cut the line off at the date of the fire. And, and that, just so they you know, that's... Did they mostly the, sell above market value before that? Or were they well right around market value? When you say market value, uh, well, what and I'm referring to as tax roll value, yeah, tax and that's roll value. historical. Uh, 
That's based on the reappraisal we just finished in 2013, but the sales that we used for the 2013 reappraisal came from 2011 and 2012. So right away, as soon as they're new, they're historical. But we're, we're kind of, we're getting into assessment terminology now rather than just pure, let's see what the market's doing after the fire. Now I'm going to assume that some of those 48 sales were probably under contract before the fire and simply closed afterward. So, but I thought as long as I pulled that, uh, that data set, I'd throw it out, let you know that we haven't seen anything uh, abnormal as far as people dumping properties and, and getting out of Dodge. Sir. Um, there has been some proposals in some citizen groups that uh, for the long term health of forested areas that we consider some uh, tax slash relationship to uh, mitigation, to mitigation behavior. Okay. Uh, would that take state legislation to uh, uh, make that happen? The, the most common form of doing something like that is through a special district, which can be formed by the, uh, the folks that live in the forest. Uh, a good example would be, let's see, which one that's recent? Old Colorado City. Uh, the retail merchants over there wanted some extra money to kind of spruce up old Colorado City, so they imposed a district upon themselves and the levy and increased their taxes with that money, that tax money that was uh, that was brought in by that additional levy earmarked just for street and sidewalk improvements and things like that. That's a fairly common way to do it. Um, that's that's an increase. If you're focused on people who have good behavior, a decrease, would that be the same way? Well, if you're talking about just targeting certain properties, the ones that have not mitigated, for example, that gets a little stickier. Uh, I don't want to speak for the county treasurer, but you can also explore the possibility of what's called a special assessment. and. The way that works is once everybody that agrees to be specially assessed, the non-mitigated properties, agree to that, then my office provides a list of those properties' parcel numbers to the treasurer, and the treasurer simply adds a flat fee onto the tax bill for whatever purpose that special assessment is earmarked. There, there are a number of avenues that, that could be explored for doing that. Yeah, you're still getting at the stick. We're looking for the carrot. Both, of the, both of the cases you proposed were sticks. Right. And, and then the second one where everybody would have to agree that it had to be mitigated property. I assume that means agree to be taxed and then do something about it. They are. I think what Rick meant was that there would be a stick for those that would be levied by the county, and the money goes to the county, and it's just a higher tax if they don't, and there would be some kind of relief if they do, to some standard. And so, of course, somebody would have to assess the properties and say, this one qualifies as a Class C mitigation, which is the minimum, or whatever, and this one doesn't. But I think, I think that there's two different things we can talk about. Sure. Any last questions before we uh, allow him to wrap up? Thank you. Thank you very much. You can start. I have now that I have uh, Senator uh, Lambert to uh, give this legislative update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I will have to kind of go quickly here because I officially turned into a pumpkin in about four minutes, but I'll try to go quickly. Uh, we did have a meeting of the subcommittee for the Legislative Support Committee last Wednesday, and uh, we are in the process of writing up the minutes of that. Uh, those, that's not quite ready yet, but we'll have a lot of documents that we'll be putting on the county website uh, for documentation of all this, because some of this is a communication flow between the congressional offices, the senatorial offices, and then the county. Uh, there are four national pieces of legislation that the county will probably want to follow here in the near future. Uh, one is by Senator Bennett, another one is by Senator Udall, another one is by uh, Congressman Scott Tipton, 
from uh, uh, Southwest Colorado uh, called the Healthy Forest Management Act. Our understanding is that that just passed out of the House last week, actually act after our meeting. Uh, I guess they knew we were having a meeting, so they got, got busy. Uh, also, Congressman Hastings uh, from other, some other state, not Colorado, I think he's on the Agriculture Committee, but has a forestry-related bill, and more of an omnibus agriculture bill that we're going to be following as well. Uh, now, in the state, of course, this last couple weeks, we have been very, very refocused on the flooding, not so much uh, the, the fire either on the uh, west side or in Black Forest. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussions within RCS and FEMA. Uh, I spent all day, well, almost all day, Saturday, uh, hiking up to the top of Rampart Range and getting pictures of the inside of Queens Canyon. Uh, I gave uh, the county one copy of that. I'd suggest the commissioners quickly look through that because it, it's showing that the watershed uh, on the other side of the ridge in Queens Canyon is very, very bad, and there has been a tremendous amount of debris damage from decomposed granite coming down through North Douglas Creek. That's just on the north side of Flying W Ranch. That is heading toward the city waters, or watershed system. So uh, I'll be getting, uh, distributing some of those uh, photographs to NRCS and other people who need, need to see them. And we went out there on, on Saturday with uh, two representatives from FEMA to actually go on scene to look at that area. Uh, last Thursday and Friday, we had meetings of the State Joint Budget Committee. Uh, as of then, we still have about $35 million of emergency funds which have not been obligated yet. Uh, most of those have been used for things like fire operations, uh, emergency operations, things like that. But we've heard some of the just the road damage and bridge damage up in the northern part of the state is probably now estimated to exceed $400 million. Uh, the state does not have the funding right now for that, but fortunately a lot of that will probably come from FEMA or U.S. Department of Transportation emergency funds, uh, which is similar to what we're trying to do on U.S. 24. That's a U.S. highway, and the governor has asked the uh, United States Department of Transportation to look at US 24 and to provide supplemental funding, perhaps to even reconstruct some of that whole area. Um, we've had quite a few studies going on in my request um, about what, how federal ownership of land and federal jurisdiction of land interfaces with our state and local government. Uh, I've had conversations with Sheriff Makita who uh, I, I think would indicate that there's a lot of confusion about who is in charge in the federal lands. On military bases like the Air Force Academy, we have a shared jurisdiction between the federal government and the local government. Interestingly, in national forests, we don't. Best we can tell, that's exclusive federal jurisdiction. They make the rules, they enforce the laws, and we want to take a look at that to see if that's the wisest way to do it. Uh, it's probably not necessary to do it that way, but it may help uh, counties like El Paso County to uh, readdress those jurisdictional issues to know who's in charge in case of emergencies like firefighting. Uh, there have been a lot of, uh, let's say, bumps in the road in doing that, and I think we need deliberate, deliberate dialogue between the federal government and the state government about how those responsibilities are shared, and Congressman Tipton's bill takes one step toward doing that in terms of how you manage forests and bringing the states to the table and having a dialogue with the federal government on forestry management. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the erosion in, in fly, the Flying W Ranch area, uh, Queens Canyon, the whole west side, Cheyenne Creek, and the Black Forest flooding, flooding have been uh, pretty thoroughly discussed this week. I think there's going to be another supplemental FEMA request that's going to be matched into the federal requests, or the state request to the federal government for all the counties involved in this month's floods. Uh, <coughs> so far, I think there's seven counties that have been declared disaster areas. That's as of, as of last Friday. 
but there were several more counties that were under consideration. Um, as part of our discussion last Wednesday, also we talked about some options for aerial tankers uh, because there's been some co conversation of having, for instance, a county helicopter uh, or having a state air tanker fleet. We want to collect and look at some, several different options. So Mr. Uh, Ed Perlick gave us some presentations to our committee, our subcommittee, and is already in discussions with several of the state committees on wildfire uh, wildfire fighting, I guess, and mitigation. We have a couple different committees that are looking at that right now. But uh, as we go forward, these are a lot of long-term considerations where we have a lot of lessons learned from what happened across the state, and uh, we want to capture those now, have a good conversation with the federal government, and, uh, and get some work done here in the next legislative session. I'm two minutes over, but uh, I, I, I could take a couple of questions if anybody has questions. This is an opportunity, since he is leaving, I, if there are questions for uh, Senator Lambert, go ahead and ask them. And if not, if anybody would like to contact me later, and I think the gentleman was here, I was going to give him a card, but uh, if anyone needs to contact me, uh, my website is just kentlambert.com. It's got my, I think it's got my cell phone number on it and everything, so just give me a call. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we will uh, receive a uh, brief update from our county uh, recovery team on our citizen service support request. All right, which one? Do you guys do rock, paper, scissors? scissors? I'm just going to give you a report. Actually, the, this last week, we... Okay, there you go. <clears throat> All right. Um, is that better? Okay. Um, mostly last week we had a request just for additional email distribution contacts. And um, to date we've had, well not to date, but from August 1st through today we've had 97 complete, um, completed and resolved customer service requests. And the majority of those um, have been actually volunteer donations and requests for volunteers to complete work. Um, a lot of questions also and research about debris removal and, cre and cleanup. So, and then we're starting to get a lot of questions about uh, revegetation. So uh, that's probably it. Um, for July, we, we didn't have this tracking system in place and there was approximately 30 outside of the deck and then the deck was closed and we started tracking differently in, in uh, July and August. So, Denise, do you have anything to add? Could I, no? Oh, and we're currently working on one more sandbagging event at Crosses for Losses. They're going to be having um, sandbagging this Saturday, and if anyone can volunteer and help, that would be great. What are the times? What time you know? It? it starts at 9 a.m. 9 a.m., and usually done by noon? It goes, in, yeah, it goes until people <laughs> or it starts raining. Okay. And the goal is to bag the remains and get it Correct. on the pallets and then <coughs> have it for a later distribution of makeup. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. Have you been distributing the best management practices that we put together in the trifold? To be uh, we're asking? we're going to still hold other questions until the end. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we want to go through the reports. Just if you could jot that down and we can address that. And I don't have. Okay, we will now move to our regional building update on our permit activity. Bob, you're up. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh. Here. Come on up, because you're going to be filmed. Oh. Come on, you're a good looking guy. Get on TV. Forget Bob and So you would like me to you know, that and see if that'll work. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Bob with the Regional Building Department, and this is Roger Lovell with the Regional Building Department. 
Uh, we're both deputy building officials. And we work in the uh, as development coordinators, and that position is we try to help the public, uh, whether it be private individuals or architects or engineers, kind of maneuver their way through the system to make sure they get their plans reviewed and a permit issued in the most expeditious manner that we can uh, possibly do. So uh, I'm just going to report some numbers uh, to let you know what kind of activities taking place out in the back Black Forest uh, burn area. So far, uh, as of 3 o'clock, and this number is kind of like the, the, the federal debt, it just kind of keeps going up every time, but not at as great a rate national debt. But uh, it, right now we're at 681 uh, total permits. Uh, out of those, we've issued 445 either demolition or debris removals or wrecking permits. And out of those 445, they've actually been assigned to 360 different addresses. So if you figure somewhere, uh, and I know the number varies between 480 and 520, it looks like we're at least about two-thirds of the way there as far as getting those structures uh, cleaned up. Uh, we've also issued 14 permits for what we call accessory or outbuildings which could be garages um, or other structures of, of that type. And most of those uh, have uh, bathroom facilities in there. So if you're thinking about applying for a permit for an accessory use or an outbuilding, I know the county has changed their rules and they're allowing that outbuilding to be built prior to the residence, which is a change. Uh, but make sure that if you are planning to do that and put a bathroom in, that you go through the health department. Mr. Tom Gonzalez is back there and can talk about that. But we want to make sure that the septic system is up and running and that you have proper sanitation um, facilities. Uh, some other numbers uh, is we've issued uh, approximately 20 permits for brand new structures. Uh, three of those are uh, modular pre-manufactured units sitting on temporary foundations. Uh, what we call a park set where there's concrete blocks and woods and tie downs and so forth and the other remaining ones are actually brand new out of the ground stick built uh, structures. Um, we have uh, in addition uh, about 15 plans for other uh, new single family dwellings in our queue um, and so they're just waiting to go through the route and I'd like to just talk about that a little bit. Uh, some of the plans have been in the process for what I'm going to say longer than uh, a usual time. And it isn't necessarily because they look like they're being hung up by any individual department, but it looks like some people have submitted the plans and then for some reason they've withdrawn them. They just check them back out of the system and of course we can't uh, process them as long as the plans aren't, aren't there. So um, I, I think it's worthwhile to make this uh, distinction, which is that if you apply for a permit now and submit plans, there are already present codes in place in the building code and the fire code. So if you submit, so uh, that's my report. And if there's any questions or comments, um, I won't be going, so I'll be back in that corner if you want to wait until afterwards and talk one-on-one. -on -one. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you can sit up if you want. We will now have the Development Services uh, Department update. Uh, I'm Craig Dossie with Development Services. We, we're in the same building as Bob over off the International Circle. Uh, our permit numbers look a lot different than theirs. As Bob said, they have you know, different permits for wrecking, different permits for demolition. We look at the, the site planning of it, basically. Um, so we're looking at you know, the, the single family home, uh, permitting detached garages, permitting at new access uh, permits if you didn't have one. Um, so our numbers look a lot different. Um, to date, we've processed 31 uh, single family uh, dwelling uh, site plans. Uh, I believe all of those have been approved. 
um, up to this point. We've, we've processed five, only five temporary use permits. I'm sure there's probably more of those situations, but those are basically for uh, if you're living in a, in a temporary uh, mobile home or a temporary uh, uh, RV, um, those fall under the temporary use permits. Um, we've also processed 28 applications for additional structures like a detached garage or a shed. Um, so our numbers look a lot different than, than regional buildings, but it has been a, a steady uh, number coming in on a weekly basis. I, I wouldn't say we've seen a spike yet. It's been, it's very, been very incremental. Um, we've had a couple situations. Uh, fortunately, the, the action that the Board of County Commissioners took um, a few months back, or I guess a month back now, um, allowed us to basically approve all of those things that I just mentioned under one application fee. So we're able to look at all of that at once. And I know a lot of people have taken advantage of that opportunity. Um, it's, it's for one fee, and you can show everything on one plan. Um, there have been a couple situations where we've had uh, property owners that are on substandard size lots uh, making rebuilding per the, the new or the, the, the current zoning very difficult in terms of meeting the setback requirements. Um, which are in, in most of the most of Black Forest is in RR5, which has a 25 foot setback requirement uh, on all property or all property lines. Um, we've sat down with some of those folks and tried to work out, you know, what is the what's the best way that you can meet those setbacks. Um, so we've you know we've been across the table with with a lot of folks and we've gotten through each of those and that's that's how we prefer to do it is, is meet with them. But, um, to date, you know, our numbers, I think we have 168 total applications um, that have been approved, but again, it is kind of incremental, and, but it has been steady. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now have an update from our infrastructure repair and construction. Max, here. And I'm Max Kirkland with uh, Public Services Department. I'll be speaking more to the, to the maintenance piece, and then in a moment, I'll be here, here Andre Bracken will be speaking more to the capital projects that are ongoing. This is, uh, our intent is to let you know that our, our focus in the Black Forest area is, on, is to work on a, the washouts, the culverts that are plugged, and the ditches, miles and miles of ditches that are are full and need to be cleaned. Um, that, exi that condition exists throughout the Black Forest area. And so what I, I estimate that this is really going to take us over a year, but we are going to systematically work our way through the entire Black Forest area and, and address um, all roads, especially the ditches and the culverts, because it's a significant problem throughout. It's not isolated to any one area. Um, this, uh, this and the next slide are just an indication of, uh, I wanted to provide kind of a, a summary of where we've been working over the last couple of weeks. And as we do this again, I'll continue to update that to just kind of show where our drainage crews have been. I, I hope I'm not standing in front of the slide, but um, I list shoot first because that's a significant problem area all the way from, say, Bridal Bit on the west to at least homes or, or beyond homes to the east. That's a significant problem area. And, and um, we, we work numerous uh, ditch and culvert problems at primarily the intersections where the problems are most prominent. And there's the rest of the list from our drainage crew. And then uh, potholes would be another piece of the puzzle. There are an increasing, we're seeing a slight increase so far. I expect that increase to actually go up because there is more traffic. There is heavier traffic on the asphalt roads. They will take a toll and, and there will be more potholes. We're, we are trying to be very attentive to that. Um, the Black Forest area among the county at large. 
we have a, a you know limited amount, a limited capability for pothole repair, but a good portion of that is being devoted in Black Forest. And then I wanted to just point out that uh, greater maintenance continues. We the floods throughout the county, not just in Black Forest, but we've been we've been everywhere in the county addressing floods the last four or five weeks straight. Um, but there is we are trying to continue with our routine greater maintenance on the gravel roads because we know that uh, winter is coming. Uh, flakes aren't far off and we'll be back into snow mode for the winter. And uh, I'd like to have as many of our gravel roads in decent shape in terms of crown and profile as possible so that they are safe and travelable. Um, you may say, Hmm. They seem degraded to what they used to be, and I would probably agree with you. That's probably a true statement. But in the context of flood uh, repairs countywide, uh, we're about as thin, thinly spread as we can be uh, to try to, to maintain ordinary gravel road maintenance. Um, we do we do have a few areas that uh, have seen maybe not necessarily directly related to post fire conditions, but just heavy rain, glider loop off of Bulmer is a great example of that. Um, there was severe washout in that area, it took out most of that entire road. We have put back a good percentage of that uh, road base and have uh, at least bladed it to a safe condition for the residents of glider loop. And uh, we'll have to come back and do more ditch work there because their ditches are also like most of the rest are full. So that's kind of a, the highlight of where, we, where we've been over the last couple of weeks and what we'll continue to do and going to get as much of it done as we can before freeze sets in and snow flies. Any questions I can answer? <coughs> we'll have you stick around. At the end there might be some. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we will now have an update from our county engineer. Good evening. I'm Andre Bracken, county engineer, and I'm glad to see you all out. I really appreciate uh, you all attending with us. Um, as Max talked about, uh, road and bridge type of product for issues out there that uh, he's repairing as a result of the current, uh, the recent flooding that has been uh, brought on by the fires. What I'm going to talk about is the, the programs and the projects that were already planned and funded uh, for this year to be done, yeah. of which we're having great challenges, as you can imagine, trying to get all the work done that we had already planned with all this flooding that we're having to take care of in the meantime. So projects under construction in 2013, the Hodgin Road project, as most of you are aware of, is a Pikes Peak RTA funded project. We are working on phase two, work, finish phase two of the project, which in this map shows basically starts at around Bar X Road and goes east to Goshawk Road. And it also includes uh, work at the Meridian Road uh, intersection with uh, Hodgin, uh, basically site distance type improvements, um, turn lanes and, uh, on Meridian getting on to uh, Black Forest Road. Uh, no signal or change in the traffic control there, but there will be turn lanes and improved site distance. And there will be, a, as, as, as you're, if you're at that intersection looking to the north, if you look back to the right on Hodge, and there's a big hill there that obstructs site distance, we're going to take that hill down so that as you look back to the right, you can see approaching traffic. That's just some of the safety type improvements we're doing there. Um, the, the biggest, I guess, the most important thing to say about the project is the, the schedule was, was drastically hurt by uh, these last storms, last couple of series of storms. What that does, basically, it causes us to have to give a contractor weather days so they can come in and do cleanup. They basically have to replace all the erosion control barriers um, with new barriers when a storm comes through and blows it all out. And then they have to clean up all the sediment that's on their project. 
when, when we award a contract to a contractor on a road project, they basically own that roadway. They basically take the responsibility of operating that roadway during the, the life of that project. So they're responsible to uh, uh, all the traffic control, flagging, all the operations to keep the road open during the construction project, cleaning up all the setup and all that. So every time we, we got a, a big storm on one of these projects, it costs more time in the overall schedule to get it completed. Very frustrating for us, very frustrating for you, and um, our goal is to get these back on track, uh, sped up if we can, and try to attain our original uh, goal here. On this one, our goal was pretty much substantial completion by around Thanksgiving. Uh, basically having all the pavement done, new paving, and even the intersection improvement at Meridian done by around Thanksgiving. Um, some other points there. Um, total cost of construction has been about $5 million. We're still on track to achieve that. And the overall cost of the project is $7.8 million. That includes all the utility relocations that we have to pay for and some property acquisition. Next slide is the Black Forest Burgess intersection project. Again, this one we've experienced the same deal with, with these storms. Uh, the contractor has to go out and basically clean up the site, remove all the, all the sediment, and that takes a day or two usually uh, to, to get back to a point where they can start working on the project again. Um, this one, I've, I've heard lots of uh, people talk about the cost. The cost hasn't changed. It's, it's about a $2 million project. And typically on a, on a signalization, a rebuild for a signal type project, you're looking at about a half million dollars typical on a, a new signalization. This one though, we're completely redoing all, all the surface. Basically all the, the paving, the, the grades, there's new turn lanes, and then all the drainage. We've had drainage problems at this intersection for years and years and years that is basically at the root of the cause when you have lots of potholes, lots of problems like that, uh, very poor conditions on the surface is usually because of poor drainage. Uh, our goal here is to fix that once and for all so we're not having to come back on a regular basis with, uh, with, with maintenance. We're hoping once we get done with this, we're in there, we're out of there, we won't have to touch this again for decades and decades. Um, again, uh, the project was impacted. The, the new schedule puts us probably into October. Um, we're, our, our major paving is going to occur here in the next couple of weeks um, where we're going to be paving Black Forest Road. Uh, next slide. Um, these are the locations for our overlay program that were approved for this year. Uh, Black Forest Road is the only significant one that is in the Black Forest region. Um, and the scope of that has been from, basically from the city limits uh, close to Calpo down near Woodman Roads. From there up to and through the Black Forest Bridge intersection and up to uh, Shoot Road. So basically we're gonna do that overlay in conjunction with the Black Forest Bridge intersection to, um, in an effort to uh, minimize the amount of impact of traffic and uh, do that basically as one paving project. You'll see that occurring here in the next couple of weeks as well. So is that going to be road closures? We're going to hold questions to the end too. Next slide. Chip seal program. Um, I think the only road really in the Black Forest region uh, would be, let's see, next slide. Walker perhaps. Walker on, on the north, um, just outside of the forest area. Uh, Bradshaw and Meridian Road, uh, we had some chip seal there from Rex to Walker. Then we did some chip seal from Stapleton to Burgess on Gregor Road. And then I want to say Windy Pine Drive, is that Latigo? It's, it's a little Canadian. Yeah, the Latigo area. Yeah. Uh, so these are the only roads that uh, we did chip seal on in, in the forest region that are complete projects. Next. Dust abatement, this is a long list. Um, all of our dust abatement program has been completed other than uh, Wild Ridge and um, Beacon Light. Um, 
and I believe we might have got a second application on that one also. So um, I think Wild Ridge might be the only one we're looking at to uh, to, to complete, but the, the rest of the roads have been done for dust control. Next. Road graveling program. This one, and maybe Max would want to give you some more detail on that. We've really pulled back on this uh, because we've just got so many washouts and other issues on gravel roads just for general maintenance. Uh, but this is basically our list there. We, we did gravel a couple roads, Windfall Way and Cypress Road. And I think that's basically all I have for you for our current uh, construction programs we have funded this year. Uh, on to projects in planning and design that we have going on. Uh, the County Line Road Project, uh, we consider this still in the forest area, but it's, as you know, all the way to the north end of the county. Um, it is a PPRTA funded project. We are basically just finishing the final design now, and we're working on an IGA with Douglas County. Um, this is the road that uh, straddles the, the county line between Douglas County and El Paso. And what this does is also a safety project. It, it builds uh, uh, paved shoulders on the road as well as uh, addresses the uh, curb linear nature of the roadway and uh, the basically hills and valleys to provide better sight distance. And it better aligns the furrow and county line road intersection. And we're probably looking at um, <coughs> going to construction on this in uh, spring to summer of next year. <coughs> next one. And this is just kind of a, a map showing. We basically start, we wrote the, the project basically starts right there at, at I-25 ramps going east over to Furrow Road, just beyond Furrow Road. And um, the segment from there from Furrow over to Roller Coaster um, we had done, actually goes on over to 83, we had done as a project, same type of project, for Douglas County back in 98 and 99. And that similar project we'll do as a part of our responsibilities between I-25 and Furrow Road. Uh, that blue portion is uh, kind of through a rough agreement with Douglas County is what we maintain. And then Douglas County actually maintains a portion from Furrow over to 83. Another RTA project uh, in design right now is uh, Baptist Road West. Uh, this is where the project calls for a new bridge uh, to replace the old bridge. Uh, the bridge will span the, uh, the railroad, thereby alleviating that, uh, that uh, situation where you have, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, you have a subdivision over there that if a, if a, a train is basically stopped on the tracks for any reason, which they do quite a bit, um, it, it puts that subdivision in a situation where they have no other access other than uh, windy mountain roads out through Monument to, uh, to get access to the public road system. So what this project will do is, is provide a great separation such that you won't have that situation with the railroad anymore. Uh, but we hope to uh, get started on this construction-wise uh, latter part of next year also. Next slide. We don't need to keep going on the back of this request. Next slide. Uh, and I'll just mention this one. This is a, a transportation enhancement project in Glen Eagle. It's basically pedestrian access. Um, we do a lot of pedestrian access. We're not just focused on just uh, vehicular roads and transportation, but we look at a lot of non-motorized uh, pedestrian access for uh, pedestrians, bicycles, and, and so, so forth. This one's a Federally funded project. Next. Uh, this one uh, will be probably near and dear to your heart, so where you drive a lot. This is just north of Shoop Road on Black Forest Road. This location I'm very concerned with. I look at looking at the uh, bottom picture there, that culvert. This is a very large culvert. There's two two separate culvert locations here. Runoff flows from the east to the west. This is an upper portion of Kettle Creek. It's part of the burn area. And we've known about this for years. We've had it on a list for federal funding. We've got federal funding attached now. We won't be able to get at that federal funding until 2015 and after to do this culvert replacement. 
But I'm concerned, you can see the opening in the two pipes there, one of the two culvert uh, locations. Um, in a big storm, if this pipe is full, what will happen is that runoff flowing through there will suck the material into that pipe system and potentially collapse the roadway. So our goal here is to get this thing replaced with a concrete box culvert as soon as we can get out that federal money. Um, we're estimating about $830,000 to do this uh, replacement, and uh, it will be 80% federally funded. Um, we have a design that's in progress. Um, it will be a, 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 an agreement with CDOT, uh, who uh, the money basically is, uh, is, is overseen by. But um, con very concerned about this location. Just want everyone to understand that uh, there is no good detour for this location. Um, so about all we can do is detour traffic several miles out of the way if, if we do experience a failure here. Next. Other project updates and just a little bit about what we're doing uh, post-fire. Um, and some of this is probably Max might want to talk about also. But um, we have done a lot of this on a regular basis on every flood. This is kind of what we end up doing. First thing we do is we close roads. We barricade roads that are overtopping. You can't get out there and fix stuff until all the water's gone. And that is often anywhere from a number of hours to a day or days before the water stops flowing and you can actually start work. So we respond initially with closing roads and bridges. Then we get out and we start removing sand, debris, and you know, all, the, all the debris that is, that is apparent. And then, only then, you can start actually looking at how to approach repair. Oftentimes, you can repair what was there with, with the same type of, of thing, but uh, go on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, get to Casey Lane. You couldn't do that with Casey Lane here. Basically, we had a... <clears throat> I want to say it was an 84 inch, yeah, an 84 inch diameter pipe that collapsed in much the same type of failure we could see on Black Forest Road with that pipe occurred here. Luckily, there was only four residents that this directly affected. Uh, but it was a catastrophic type of failure where the pipe had holes in it, you had that material sucked into the pipe, and then you had the failure. There's enough runoff that, that took the pipe sections <coughs> downstream. We can't replace what was there with a light pipe section because we know that the runoff is so high that uh, it would be a waste of money. So we were luckily able to get some uh, uh, one of our contractors to respond very quickly with some concrete box sections. So next slide. And that bottom picture there is the size, basically a seven foot by seven foot concrete, reinforced concrete <coughs> box is what we replaced the old pipe with. And uh, this sizing is more appropriate for the kind of flows we're, we're seeing now in Kettle Creek. Um, as it turns out, we got a bunch of these box sections donated to us from uh, Denver International Airport who decided they did not need these particular sections anymore. So we saved the county a lot of money by getting these uh, box sections. This project is not completed yet. We've got uh, drop structures to put in the creek. We also have wing walls we want to put on this pipe to basically make sure that it's stable in place and we don't have a big flood that's going to move these boxes for the future. So. This location here is immediately upstream of that Casey Lane box. As you can see, we have a, a small uh, elliptical shaped uh, metal pipe here. We need to replace this with at least the same size box section or even bigger type capacity at this location. Unfortunately, you can see there's maybe four or five feet of grade from where the, uh, the, the invert or the, uh, the, the bottom of the channel is to the top of the, the roadway. This roadway overtops on a regular basis now. It's almost every storm, a one-year storm, is going to overtop the road. So we're out there. Um, we'll, we'll get the call. Someone sees it, sheriff for a resident, and we rush out there, put the barricades up close to the road. We're going to be doing that on a regular basis until we can get a substantial amount of capacity um, in the pipe system to pass the runoff. <coughs> now, as you can imagine, if we put a seven by seven foot box in here, we're going to have to pick the roadway up probably 
five feet or so. That means a very large roadway project, probably a half a mile of roadway construction just to do the <coughs> closing that roadway off for how time, much time it takes to get a box that size in. But combined with that, we've got all kinds of utilities in this roadway. So right now, our engineers are looking at, we've done a lot of uh, potholing utilities, so we know where everything's at. We're trying to get a, some alternatives worked out. And it looks like right now, the most feasible thing to do is put in a battery of pipes. At least that way, we've got a lot more capacity. It'll keep the road open longer. It's not ultimately what we'd what we like to do, but it's probably what we're going to need to do in the uh, short time frame. Next slide. Hazard trees, um, Max may want to talk about this one too. His guys and our guys have worked together on this whole issue. Um, we've come up with a criteria working with FEMA that identifies um, an amount of money that they should reimburse the county for having to deal with hazard trees as a result of fire. Um, it's a very, very important issue that we need to get at for the residents out there immediately. We have basically a deadline of January 26th. We've taken this criteria. Uh, we put together work with FEMA, got their feedback. They're okay with the criteria. Now what we need to do is finalize the spec, get a contract out, get a contractor on board, and start removing all these hazard, hazard trees. Basically a hazard tree is anything that is basically a, is a, basically a hazard to motorists. Now we've also included in there trails. Basically, we've looked at all our uh, county trails where we've got hazard trees also, and we've got money coming for that also. So hopefully we can get a contractor on board and clear out all these hazard trees and deal, deal with that issue right away. And I think that's all the slides I've got for you. Well, it's a county trail. We are going to hold questions to the end. And I will hang around to hopefully answer your questions. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, I think Tim Walken, you're up. Hey everyone, I am Tim Walken, Director of Community Services for El Paso County. I'm going to talk about parks and environmental and our slash mulch facility. We've talked about quite a few of these, so I will go through them relatively quickly. But just a quick update for you on the trail system of Black Forest Regional Park. We are working with the Rocky Mountain Field Institute. They'll be out through mid-October with us, and they're working on the various drainage areas we have within Black Forest Regional Park. And that's certainly important for those of you that live near the park as well. And so we're we have four of those drainage areas, and we're about a number two and a half to three at this point. And they've appreciated their help very much, and also the, the Pike City Community Foundation provided funding for that, which we're also very grateful for. Um, also, the Community Foundation provided funding to, to uh, fix the playground at Black Forest Regional Park. If you spend much time there, you realize it's been closed for quite some time due to flooding issues through the park itself. We think we've corrected those enough that we can now fix the playground itself, and so we have funding for that. And we've got uh, high school students from Pike Creek. Pine Creek High School going to have to assist us with that. Um, it's a lot of hand work involved, and I think there's 100 students coming out, so we'll keep them busy. Uh, as Andre said, we're also working with FEMA as well on fence repairs, tree replacement, structural improvements as well, and the various parks that were um, impacted by the fire and then in the flooding itself. Uh, good news in number four, looks like we'll be able to open up some additional trails at Black Forest Regional Park relatively soon. We have been working on some of the hazard trees, and so there will be other sections you'll see open here relatively soon. And then finally, we are, we're finishing up our burned assessment area and park properties that includes Black Forest Regional Park, Section 16, and the Pineries Open Space. And that'll be kind of our roadmap as we go along working with FEMA and public services and a variety of our partners uh, in order to be able to begin to restore those parks as well. And we'll be bringing that to the Park Advisory Board at their meeting in October. You're welcome to attend and you can hear the presentation on that. And there'll be a public input process after that Park Advisory Board meeting. So if you're interested, please see me afterwards and I'll make sure that you get a copy of that burn assessment report. Next slide. Black Forest Slash Mulch Site. Uh, I want to give just a tremendous uh, amount of thanks to the Sam Cobb who runs the Black Forest Slash Mulch Facility and all the volunteers. It's been a tremendous year for them, as you can imagine. And they also agreed to stay open to collect slash through September the 28th, which was tremendous as well. That was once again volunteers doing that. We greatly appreciate that. So Jeff DeWitt's here, who's the chair. Let's give him a round of applause. If we and maybe other volunteers.
pictures in the audience too, and thank you very much for that as well. But if you use that facility, for every person you see out there is a volunteer. And so they just do a phenomenal job, and we greatly appreciate that. One interesting thing that's come up is, and we all recognize that we'll close September 20th with our volunteer program, we have been approached by a private business about the possibility of keeping the slash mall facility open after September the 28th. And we're exploring that at this point and looking at the various options and, and whether it's feasible to do that. But some of the things that we've come up with on A through G are important to us and I think also the SAMCOM board as we've talked to Jeff about these as well. We certainly want to make sure that SAMCOM is back as they always have been and have been for many years and so May through the end of September they will be there to do that. Um, let me just touch on some of the highlights here. Under 2C, we do have some pretty good piles of mulch if you've driven by. We'd like them to figure out a way to get rid of that mulch if they decide they want to do this and they have more options at times than what we have. Uh, on D, we'd like them off the site by the third week of April to give SAMCOM a chance to be able to come back in again. E is critically important to us that if they're going to be there, we want them open to accept slash. We're looking at Saturdays at this point in time, but if they're willing to do Sunday as well, that's great. But at a minimum, at least Saturday, uh, certainly having their insurance coverage. And, and 2G is very important as well. When, when we do the bid proposal, if we get that far, we want to hear about what their plans are and see if it's a good match for the site. You know, we're not sure that we're looking at big logging operations. We don't think that works in that site. but. You know, maybe either a minor type of, of uh, tree work could, and so we'd like to hear from that contractor and what they view, you know, they're using the site, and how does that factor into the slash mulch collection as well. And so it'll be kind of interesting to see if there's companies out there willing to do that. Um, and then on the next slide, if we do decide to go forward of talking to county leadership, some of the things that we will look at, we'd like to have a meeting with sort of the SAMCOM board of directors and also interested residents and kind of talk about the things that I was just discussing and getting more feedback. The state land board actually owns the site itself. We have a lease arrangement with them. Obviously, we'd have to talk to them as well. There could be zoning issues going from a nonprofit to a private business managing that site. So we have to look at that issue as well with our county attorney's office and development services and see if we can work through those. And then if all that comes together and we as a community agree we'd like to move forward, then we look at some sort of a bidding process to determine who would be the best fit for that particular site. Um, so I'm probably wondering, well, how long will all that take? Um, I think probably best case scenario would be December 1. I think it would take us that long to work through that process. Could go quicker, uh, but I, I, I would imagine it'll take us that much time to go through that. But the benefit at the end of the day would be is the facility would be open during the winter months. There's still a lot of fire mitigation work going on, which is great. And it would give people a chance to go to bring it to the, the slash mulch site through the winter. And then, of course, we'll, we'll open back up here with Sam Cobb in May. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. My, my colleague, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a lot to cover yet. I'll keep it brief. Um, some of the different groups that I'm in charge of, uh, one of them is Mentor Connections. Um, we've had some fantastic meetings. We continue to have them monthly for the mentor connections. Uh, they're very well attended. Between 75 to 200 people show up every time. And our Waldo Canyon families have consistently shown up to be the mentors for each one of the uh, roundtable discussions that we have. We uh, usually open the meetings. Uh, we had one last night. Uh, we had almost 100 folks attend and open up the meetings with a discussion. Last night, uh, Mark Letterman, our, our county assessor, was there, and he talked about some of the issues he spoke to you this evening about. Uh, we had uh, groups there last night from uh, seniors to inventory still, and if you are looking for information on inventory and what we're doing and didn't make it to the meeting last night, I've got some of the inventory uh, papers here that you're welcome to take with you. Uh, we also are looking at next month having one of the roundtables uh, discuss holidays because the Waldo Canyon families really expressed that that's one of the things that really hit them over the head without thinking about it, that all of a sudden the holidays were upon them. Uh, grandma's turkey platter that had been handed down for three generations wasn't there anymore. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with it with kids? Uh, what do you do when you're missing those Christmas ornaments that your family's been collecting for 30 years that are not on the tree? Um, we're looking at, and I propose that we find someone who would uh, design and come up with uh, a Black Forest um, ornament that can be handed out to each one of the families 
as we move forward. Black Horse Together is working on putting together a couple of celebrations at the Black Horse Community Center, where we'll have a turkey dinner uh, for Thanksgiving and or for Christmas. So for folks that might just want a little bit of camaraderie to come together to relate to one another on how difficult it is and give each other big hugs and share a little bit of, um, of, of joy and thanks. Uh, we'll help them help them begin to hopefully set new traditions with a couple of new items. Um, it continues to be, I think, a, a group that uh, mentors so well to one another. Um, Aspen Point is lovely. They've been there on a consistent basis. Bob Croft and Roger have been there on a consistent basis with regional building. And I can't thank our staff enough for uh, continuing to be at evening meetings, consistently helping uh, with compassionate hearts, all of our Black Forest survivors. Um, the next meeting that we're going to be having for the Black Forest uh, Well Defined Mentor Connections Group is going to be Monday, October the 21st, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Pinery again. And I have to thank them for continuing to turn down events that are happening at the Pinery to host this at no cost to the survivors, might I add. So if you have events that you want to pay for in the future, Boy, go have them at the Pinery because they have been wonderful partners with us. Um, insurance is another thing, and we are having our next insurance meeting this um, coming, well, October the 3rd, Thursday, October the 3rd, and that is going to be at the Woodman Valley Chapel East, so out on Woodman Road, east of Powers. We'd like to make sure that you uh, go to see that. Also, we have received, the because of the FEMA uh, delegation, um, and disaster declaration that was signed uh, by our president for all of those that have been involved in flooding issues. <coughs> Anybody involved or impacted by a flood issue uh, since September the 11th can now go to the Colorado Springs Fire Department located at 375 Printers Parkway. FEMA has set up an office <coughs> there and it's going to be open from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and definitely at this point in time. So we certainly want people to go there to find out um, how they deal with things, whether it was structural issue, windows, doors, septic and sewer, well, um, utilities, heating, do they need housing assistance uh, from, the from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. All of those things are going to be um, dealt with at that location. And certainly we'll have the link to that on our Paso County website as well, and on the Black Forest Together website, so you can find out more information on that. Uh, one of the things that we're beginning to look at uh, with our development services with Craig Dossi is, you know, possible uh, tree blight uh, designation. Can we have a tree blight designation? Is it within statute for us to be able to do so? What might that look like? Um, and how can the El Paso County Commissioners move forward with something, if that is allowable, uh, within our area? Um, I think that is about it. wanted to just say for our emergency preparedness zombie run this Saturday, uh, if you were going to think about registering, uh, we are actually full. We have 350 slots all filled, and so you can come be a zombie if you'd like and volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we'd like you to bring your families by, especially some of our Black Forest families. It's going to be at Fox Run Regional Park this Saturday from 9 until 12.30. We're going to have a lot of different vendors set up there on how do you do inventory for your house pre-disaster. Um, what kind of things do you need in a kit that's a 72-hour kit that you need to have your 10-minute plan, your one-hour plan, your one-day plan. So come on out. You can't ride anymore. You can come be a zombie, but you can certainly bring your families by to find out about emergency preparedness issues. And that would be it. Thank you, Commissioner Blair. Thank you very much. Okay, we will have our financial update from uh, good evening, uh, Brian Olson. I'm with uh, uh, Budget Administration. And I don't have a whole lot of updates from uh, from the last couple of months for as far as uh, the costs and whatnot. I can tell you that uh, we are in the process of submitting paperwork for uh, to to the state for what you may call the FMAG, or the it's the Fire Management Assistance Grant. And you may imagine it's thousands and thousands of papers and receipts and supporting documents that we have to get to them. And, and trying to, to be reimbursed back uh, for, for the cost of the fire. The other part would be working with, uh, with FEMA on the public assistance grant. Um, and we're in the process, and that's the tree removal and those types of things. There. Um, I do want to make mention and kind of tag team a little bit on, on the FEMA 
part that Commissioner Littleton was talking about. And I went ahead and put it on the board over here where the Disaster Recovery Center is. And just, just as Commissioner uh, Roosevelt said, it's at the, uh, the headquarters there. We really want to uh, encourage people that, that feel they may have damage to go ahead and register with FEMA to, uh, to register that damage to, to see if you qualify. Um, one, one thing that, uh, there's three ways to, to, to register. You can actually go down to the Disaster Recovery Center. There's an 800 number there you can call, and you can go on the website, which I also have the website written down there. Uh, to register your your, uh, your, your property. Uh, one thing that I think really does uh, affect black forest areas, uh, people that individual roads and uh, and, not, and also individual roads that are owned and used by multiple households <coughs> can also qualify for this. So um, please, you know, again, don't lose out on your, uh, on your some, some possible aid on that. So. Um, now, an individual, they can, uh, these could qualify only for water damage, as she was saying, is that correct? Correct, and that's, oh. it's for the September 11th uh, and, beyond uh, and, and beyond floods, so, um, so, and that's kind of the key, the, the, the key issue there, but again, if you have flood damage, I would go ahead and register it, okay, so, um, the, what will happen is, is a, a FEMA representative will have to come out and do assessments with you. And, and uh, um, at this point, I know FEMA has over a thousand boots on the ground. As you can imagine, the majority of those people are, are up north, but we do have people down here. Um, El Paso County was was one of the counties that was uh, uh, will benefit from the, the uh, individual assistance. So. Um, I did put there's another website at the very bottom there. It's it's www.coemergency.com. It's a great website to get information, updating information um, for people that are getting uh, looking for individual aid. It kind of helps you to, to get links into FEMA and, and what kind of paperwork you need. It's it's a good tool, and you can get ongoing information as as, as time goes on too. So it's it's a it's a good website to, to use. So I don't have anything else besides that. Great, thank you. At this portion of the agenda, we will now uh, entertain any nonprofits that would like to uh, address the board. I will start with, I know we have a representative from Black Force, Kevin. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm uh, Leif Garrison, and I'm here actually on behalf of both uh, uh, Black Force Taylor and the Black Force Community Foundation. We're partnering in Black Force. Uh, we, uh, we really feel that we're in a, a good position based on uh, the county's efforts with this committee uh, so far. I understand the county is going to move into a sort of a less intense phase two, and I think the um, certainly the FT and the, and the community foundation are, are ready to sort of step forward at this point. Um, thanks, especially to Commissioner Glenn uh, for leadership on that, and, and uh, certainly Commissioner Littleton, especially with that mentorship program, which I know uh, has been so valuable for so many people, and of course the county's efforts with uh, streamlining the land development code. Uh, the initial low course disaster assistance uh, center. Uh, too many things to mention, so I don't want to get bogged down. So uh, based on uh, where we are now with uh, really a good foundation being laid by the county, um, I've got a couple of uh, requests for assistance um, from the county. Uh, just a little bit of background, though, first, that um, the focus of Black Force Together and the Community Foundation has been to coordinate cooperate with uh, a number of very generous uh, nonprofit and volunteer agencies. I don't need to list them. I think they're familiar to everybody who's been at these meetings. But a, a big part of the um, impetus for Black Force Together is to coordinate and cooperate. Um, there is the resource center that's uh, currently hosted uh, at the fire department. Um, uh, that resource center, of course, is open to all um, agencies and they've been able to fit in a number of uh, agencies that are there together, uh, such as VOAD, uh, Catholic Charities, uh, Lutheran Family Services. Um, I think the, uh, I know that there was a, the Small Business Administration uh, was hosted there, so uh, that is the nucleus at this point. Our perception is of the recovery support network that Commissioner Glenn mentioned, and uh, the hope is for that to continue. Uh, two other important functions beyond the uh, coordination element of the resource center. Um, the 
the concept that knowledge and information is power uh, is very important, I think. And uh, uh, the website is under development. It uh, certainly has been up for a long time. Our intention is that it will soon be much more powerful than it is now. And in addition, uh, Black Force Together is now doing uh, periodic um, email blasts to everyone who's interested. Uh, you don't have to have suffered a, a loss or uh, uh, burn damage. It's everybody in the community. Everybody's affected by the, the fire. In addition, and finally on that, on that aspect, uh, there is a great deal of focus on forest recovery. Uh, the uh, Black Horse Together and the Community Foundation intend to soon uh, host a large and open uh, forest recovery symposium probably will be hosted at the uh, Black Forest Community Center, which also, of course, is an important part of these efforts. Uh, we're looking at either the last weekend of October or the first weekend of November. More de details to follow through the email blast. The website uh, will release uh, uh, far and wide. Um, and uh, we expect to have a large turnout for that. And, and part of the uh, thing I wanted to mention very briefly is timing. Uh, my understanding is that planting, especially of grasses, etc., uh, is best done before the snow gets real heavy. And that's, that's the idea is to hopefully bring that uh, together before then. So with that background in mind, that's kind of what Black Force Together and the Community Foundation are working on. Here are the two requests that we have. Um, first of all, there are two large uh, county-owned park areas uh, within the uh, forest that, of course, sustained, unfortunately sustained bad fire damage. Um, as a result, there's a lot of runoff from uh, those parks, and uh, we know that the, the county, of course, has been very helpful in providing uh, sandbags to help sort of uh, control and mitigate uh, that runoff at this point. But it's clear that uh, in terms of revegetation and sort of addressing those long-term needs, that a coordinated effort between county parks and uh, Black Force Together and those groups that work together with uh, Black Force Together um, would, be, would be critical, would be essential. And so our request would be that uh, we would ask if parks can maybe designate a liaison or representative to work with us, uh, work with these groups to uh, help manage those runoff issues uh, related to those park projects. Uh, secondly, the second request is that, and I think the uh, the assessor, Mr. Lutterman, uh, uh, referenced this. The map that was developed by the assessor's office, um, which, as he described, uh, uh, helped to correlate and, and uh, indicate where there was uh, damaged buildings, um, we're hopeful that we might be able to arrange a way where that map can be updated monthly as the rebuilding process begins, as <coughs> measurable, uh, sort of visible, um, touchstone for everybody in the forest to see that recovery is taking place. Um, our understanding is that we would need some assistance both from the assessor's office, uh, High Speak Regional Building I know is here, and, and uh, perhaps uh, some GIS staff time. Uh, we would hope that uh, we would be able to minimize or eliminate any cost to the county. Um, I think, in other words, this could be digitally done without um, additional cost and, uh, and uh, something that, again, that I think it'd be distributed to the residents of Black Forest to let them see uh, the recovery as it, as it begins to take place. So our hope is that both of these requests fit within that larger framework that I've described, that collaborative, cooperative uh, framework, uh, leveraging community assets, generous volunteers, uh, nonprofits who are working hard uh, to help with that recovery. And uh, those would be those two requests. So to summarize, you know, we have a lot of very generous people and organizations in Black Forest that are stepping forward. Uh, many of them are coordinated with uh, Black Forest Together and are part of the resource uh, center that's being hosted at the fire department. Uh, there is room for anybody that wants to help any organization. Um, uh, there's, again, uh, a number of, of organizations with footprints, if you will, at the, uh, the fire station. And we understood from the beginning that the county's goal was not to create some sort of permanent layer of, of government or infrastructure or presence, but to help launch the efforts and allow uh, citizens and volunteers and nonprofits to 
continue with that uh, long process of recovery. And uh, that's exactly uh, what we have in mind. That's exactly uh, what is underway. And uh, with these two elements at this point, these are the only things that, that we can think of that, that the county can help us with. And, and we're hopeful that uh, we can, uh, uh, with that help, uh, continue on the efforts that we've already got started. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we have a crisis for lots of representatives. You lost the rock, paper, scissors games. I figured that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jenny Holiday. I'm the administrative support volunteer. Um, My time has volunteered to manage our, uh, our day to days while the rest of our volunteers are available to support the immediate and urgent needs of the Black Forest community and its residents and neighbors. Um, I have several questions this evening, but the first and, and most important uh, question that I have is in trying to find residents' resources, residents' funding, um, and I appreciate the FEMA representative coming in. I appreciate other uh, nonprofit resources stepping forward and contacting me personally and saying, hey, I have this available for you. Hey, can I meet with you? You have residents that I know that have this specific need. Let me give you my information. Karen Share has been one. Um, Tri Lakes Cares has been one. I also want to thank the residents of Black Forest who were unaffected that have actually reached in um, and personally donated not only uh, household goods, um, food, but their own houses for uh, other neighbors. But they've also dug into their pockets to pay our rent and to pay our utilities and to help keep us in the location that we are at. However, as one of the nonprofits of the community that is still awaiting their 501c3 approval. My question, first and foremost, is Fire Station 1 has now been established as the resource center focal point for a nonprofit and other nonprofits. My question is. When do we move in? <laughs> the director of one of those nonprofits is the chair of Black Forest Fire. He sits on a chair for the Black Forest Community Foundation. He chairs the community club, which is closing off assets and resources that should be made available to nonprofits that have done the legwork and filled out the paperwork and are also waiting for their approvals? Well, I, I can respond in, in the fact that I would like you to um, first try to work that with the particular station to see if they would be able to provide similar accommodations. Uh, I have had a conversation with one of the board members and you know, from the county's perspective, you know, we aren't in the position of you know, dictating anything like that, but we we are interested in the fact that from FEMA standpoint, since we have a liaison, uh, we're supposed to be working with our liaison to communicate with them that we have nonprofits in the area that are willing and ready to step up and they have an adequate foundation in place. And to have an adequate foundation, you need to have a, an adequate facility. Where are you going to be long term? So people understand that once the county is essentially stopped their emergency response and the community is essentially fully engaged that um, there's a process in place that's you know essentially stable so I would ask that you uh, try to work that issue out and see whether or not similar accommodations I don't know what the long-term plan of um, Black Forest together but um, I'm sure that the representative here will probably take that information back and um, let us keep us, let us know, because that's something that we have to be made aware of. As a taxpayer, as an El Paso County taxpayer, 
my tax dollars are paying your mill levy to provide housing for a nonprofit. I didn't vote for that. I didn't okay it. It was never brought to anyone's attention it was decided. So to me, that's not where I voted for my tax dollars to go. And now I have neighbors who could really benefit from the beds that are in the upper floor or put all the clothing up there to make it easily accessible. Do I have to get a vote for that? It's my money. That's how I feel. And that's how many of my neighbors feel. And, and you know, and again, we would ask that you make that request to that board that is a separate governmental entity as far as the, the fire district. They make the decisions on whether or not they do that. They are personally accountable to their residents for those particular decisions. Um, from our perspective, we just want to be kept in the loop and see whether or not there's an issue that we can help facilitate. Uh, some collaborative conversations back and forth, but uh, I thank you for bringing that issue up. Any other nonprofits that would like to address the board before we move on to our next item? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Jeff DeWitt, representing Samcom. Um, up until June 11th, we were having about an average year. Uh, re uh, reopened on the 20th of June, and since then, uh, I think we're going to exceed our record year by about 40 percent. Uh, we'll take in over 50,000 cubic yards of slash this year. And, um, you know, the, the site bosses, we've got about 20, 22 site bosses. We've had several hundred volunteers. They've all worked very hard. and. I would like to say we appreciate the recognition that the county has given us, especially as described by Tim Wolken. Um, the biggest concern that we have is the remaining mulch. And uh, Tim and Kathy Andrew have been in contact with us. Uh, the directors of SAMCOM have reviewed what they're working on, and we're in complete support of that. Uh, it looks like there would be some difficult things to overcome as far as that plan goes. Um, but we certainly applaud the effort to try to uh, keep that site open for something that benefits the community as far as bringing slash in through the winter. Uh, and I feel like, uh, you know, Tim and, and the rest of his folks have addressed our concerns uh, fairly completely up to this point. I can say I think it'll be difficult for them to make that happen, we hope they can. Um, it would certainly be something that would help. Uh, we've had a lot of people ask if we can extend our hours, make the site bigger, that sort of thing. Not really practical to do that because our volunteers are kind of tired at this point of the year, uh, and they've had enough, I think. And it gets dark, you know, it's winter, so. Uh, but certainly if there's something that can be done there, we support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other nonprofits before we move to the next item? Okay. Uh, I appreciate the next item is to review the upcoming recovery meetings. I appreciate Commissioner Wellington mentioning the October 3rd uh, uh, insurance meeting, the October 21st mentor connection. We uh, just recently coordinated, I'll be announcing right now, that we will be having it's almost a transportation town hall specifically for Black Forest residents. Uh, the county engineer is going to give a, a detailed update. Uh, you kind of got a preview of that, but during my the coffees that we've been having on Fridays, there has been a growing interest in wanting to have <coughs> a meeting. And it's going to be uh, Saturday, October 19th. Let me see, from 9 to 11 at the Black Forest Community Club. So we, we will make sure that people are well aware of that, but it will be Saturday uh, from 9 to 11 on October 19th at the Peony Center in Black Forest. And that's where you know, we'll be able to really focus in and go into detail on some of the uh, transportation projects that are occurring in the forest. And the, uh, right now the only other meeting coming up in October will be our 
monthly meeting, and that will be on October 30th. We would love to have a meeting the day before Halloween, just to kind of give everybody instructions on what to wear. <laughs> Come on, you gotta laugh a little bit. Come on, get laughing. <laughs> Work with me, people. <laughs> but yeah, well, that'll be our, our monthly check-in. As far as any other announcements, I do want to take this opportunity to recognize one person. Denise, stand up. You know, this this will be her last meeting. This has been my, my superstar for, that's been helping out for a long time. She's moving on to bigger and better things, but I just can't uh, express enough how much work she has done to communicate uh, to you guys, and she's been uh, right there helping me out, so I personally want to thank her and, and embarrass her. To uh, public comment, so um, feel free to make your way up to the microphone if you have any questions. Come on up. I think we had a couple for Andre. This is uh, off the wall, maybe, but um, sir, could you tell us your name? Just like I'm Joseph Michener, okay. uh, just outside of the burn areas, I guess. Um, I was wondering if, uh, well, actually two things. You talked about a map, uh, maybe uh, could get some help with a map that would show the development of the uh, burnt areas and the burnt properties and all that. And I was thinking that one of the biggest things that would help a lot of people uh, don't have insurance is help from outside purchasers coming in to buy a property. And I was wondering if there's some way that uh, uh, wouldn't require much, I think, on one of these websites or all of them. They could uh, post uh, things which show interested parties from outside uh, were thinking about buying property, maybe at fire sale prices. What kind of prices there are, we, they could just uh, go along like they have on the Earth, uh, Google Earth, uh, and uh, or a map kind of a thing, and uh, zoom in and and check uh, prices that uh, for property owners could report uh, what kind of price they'd be willing to take for their property and all. Uh, I think that would uh, make uh, sales would, uh, easier to, uh, to work out and, and encourage outside money to come in, which we need a lot of. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about was, um, I, anybody know what ground rent is? Ground rent taxation, anybody? You own 40 acres in Black Forest, and it burns. Everything you ever built, all your barns, all the, let's include the wells that you drilled, and, and all the, you've got crops, you've got cattle, uh, everything's burnt. Uh, uh, but yet, you can still rent out your land uh, for the ground rent. And the closer your land is to a big city, to the center of a big city, the greater and greater this ground rent becomes. And uh, economists back in the 1700s pointed out in France that uh, this is the most equitable way to raise revenue for any government institution, ground rent, because the individual, the owner, is in no way responsible for the ground rent. Ground rent is only uh, develops and is only increased because society, because people choose to live around that property. Uh, and uh, therefore, since the owner is in no way responsible for it, society is responsible for that value, then society has a perfect right to take it back every year as taxes. And uh, they did that for nearly 100 years in France. It was a prime source of revenue for them. Uh, and uh, this has interested me for some time. And this is an excellent opportunity, especially with a map like this, to get, uh, to get an idea uh, what ground rents are in this area uh, and how they vary, uh, which is something I would like to study. So uh, I think it serves a, a double purpose, mine, a minor purpose, and, and people who like to sell their land, uh, maybe a major purpose. Sure. You know, and I appreciate those comments, and I, I certainly would uh, uh, 
invite you to have those conversations with Black Forest together. From the county standpoint, that's not something that would fall under our statutory guidelines that we could participate in um, because we do not like to uh, get into the marketplace. Uh, we, we have to remain neutral with regard to that. It falls outside of our statutory authority. But any citizens group could do exactly what you're talking about. And you might want to attend one of the Black Forest Together meetings and see if that's something they would like to incorporate. But I'm kind of curious to see if that would, would work. Thank you. But, uh, definitely thank you for your, your input. Any other questions? Jim, you had a few. Did your, did your questions get answered? I'll get the last word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to close the night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name's Paul Hill. Uh, lived on Brentwood, lost a house, and had a question about uh, the concern about the uh, sprinkler systems. I know it's been discussed before, and I'm hearing three or four different uh, solutions for this. If I had a house that was 2,000 square feet, and I built a new house that's 3,000 square feet, my builder told me today that I have to put in either a cistern or a and, and he's, I don't know if this is the fire department telling him this or if this is his code. I understand the code is the, as the code is written today. But he told me, the way he explained it to me was, if your volume increases what you had before, and your volume increases by some magic number, then you're required to spend either a $5,600 uh, one-time fee. So that, you're, you're shaking your head, that is a complete funk. Because he also told me, he said, if you build your garage first, that has to factor into the square footage of your home. So, because I'm, I'm looking at building my own garage first. So, none of that's true. Well, do you want, Bob Crofton, do you want to corroborate that and talk about the character? I, I, I hear that, but I keep hearing him tell me that he's talking to somebody here yeah. in the White Forest. The, the issues that you're talking about are fire code issues. For either Black Forest Fire or Falcon Fire, depending upon what district you live in. So, as far as a detached garage goes, uh, that code wise is called an accessory use building. So, an accessory use building is completely different than a brand new single family dwelling, which is your house. So, that could either have an attached garage or a detached garage. My understanding is, is that if the garage is attached, it is figured in the square footage when the uh, fire department does their calculations. If it's detached, then it isn't figured in uh, to those calculations. Um, I know from going to a meeting at uh, La Forêt, I believe is what it's called, uh, several months ago that the Housing Building Association put on a seminar. There were several people there. The fire department was there. And I believe that I'm correct in making this statement, the, uh, which was, if you rebuild a house the same size or smaller, you would be, and this is my word, grandfathered. You wouldn't need to worry about fire flow. However, if you build it larger, then you would need to then be looked at according to the fire flow. And then there are several options on the fire flow. One could be sprinkling the house. The other could be putting in a cistern. And the third one that I understand uh, is the contribution to a fire fund. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that uh, uh, amount is, but the six those monies would, those monies would then told. go into a common fund. And then the fire department would choose what to do with those as far as building public cisterns or more equipment or whatever, I'm not sure. It's really controlled by them, it's their fee, uh, and, and they would be the ones that would be in charge of dispersing it. Talk to them, but it's for bigger houses than that. So, so this is where I'm confused. It said if I build the same square footage or smaller, I'm okay. That was the statement that was made by the fire marshal of Falcon Fire at the meeting at La Ferrari. Right. Right. So that's what we're Look, hearing. But, and, and, I, and again, this is an extremely volatile issue. So let's just put it politely. And, and we are still trying in the process of, once the fire districts essentially adopt their proposed amendments that they would like to refer to the Board of County Commissioners, we're going to schedule a, a work session so that we can kind of 
talk about these things, but we get calls like this all the time. And the only thing we can do from a county is it ask you to get independent legal advice on interpreting that. Because the, the code is the code. That's really the bottom line. You should be under the rules that are in place. We have not uh, approved any amendments or anything like that. So you, as a, a person that's entering into the market, as an individual, I highly recommend that you get independent advice so that you aren't steered one way or the other because you're going to end up in a situation where you're going to say, well, so-and-so told me this, and then you're going to end up being liable either for the fire district or whatever. We have a responsibility to make sure that you legally protect yourself, get independent legal advice if it's that much of a gray area. We're aggressively trying to get this issue before the Board of County Commissioners. Right. You've told me this before, and we yes. really appreciate that, but it's, it's still very confusing. Absolutely. It is to us, too. Okay. Talk to the fire department. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions before Judy's? <laughs> Going once. <laughs> All right, Judy, you're up. Oh my. Okay. Um, I guess I have questions in two areas. The rest of the stuff I'll just ask privately. I would like to ask Craig about this concept of light. Yeah. Is there a question there? Uh, yeah. What is it? Um, actually, I was just researching it. Um, <laughs> so your question is perfect in time. Um, you know, there, we handle blight in different ways. Um, the the most obvious way that we can handle blight um, under state statutes is under our police powers, um, and that can come in the form of a code enforcement action. Um, to court. Commissioner Littleton uh, received an email from somebody who said, you know, I could, re I could get 10% back on the cost of the trees from my insurance company if it was determined that that was a blight situation. Obviously, we're not, you know, jumping out the door to try to, um, try to institute code enforcement actions against properties. That's, that's not the plan. Um, but that, that it may be a situation where, um, you, you might actually have landowners that are, are hoping for that, um, and it's something that we're going to have to we're going to have to discuss and get the, the county attorney's office involved, obviously. Um, but I think that might be a way to, to deal with that. And again, I've researched it for about 15 minutes now, so I'm not exactly an expert on it. But I do think that that's that's a a potential avenue for for achieving that if if that's what the the plan is. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't uh, identify myself. Judy Ball, Felt Black Forest News. Uh, the other questions have to do with the slash mulch thing and what Mr. Wolken presented with that. Um, first observation is a comment. Um, you mentioned that you would be talking with SAMCOM and interested residents. Uh, I think that specifically needs to include the Black Forest Together Forest Recovery Committee. Um, if the, if this winds up being just an extension of slash disposal, I don't see a lot of problems with this. Okay, um, and that, but I do think it needs to be made clear whether it's green slash disposal, black slash disposal, or both. If a contractor takes over, I think in addition to allowing the public, however that's defined, to bring slash in, what about contractors that are working for the public? Currently, contractors that are working for someone who lives in Black Forest and doing fire mitigation can bring in a larger truckload of stuff as long as they have a letter saying we're working for some old people that can't do this and it's here in the community and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I see a different situation if a profit-making business is running this and is expecting mom and pop to bring in a pickup load here and there versus someone who's doing serious mitigation who might be bringing in larger loads and whether or not it's free or paid for. Um, I think there needs to be, before any of these bid are included in the bid thing, a complete disclosure of planned activities with regard to impacts on noise, traffic, 
um, the hours of operation and that sort of thing and exactly what would be done if it would include log sorting and shipping. You know, because if you have a large operation in there, you need to have a certain volume every day, every hour of the day to keep it profitable. It's, it's not at all like the volunteer situation we have now. So I, I just wanted to bring up those things that should be sure to be covered if this is bid out. I, I think it's a good thing to be able to continue the slash disposal, and there are certainly additional needs, but the the slash site is located right in the middle of the community. It's not out around the edges. Um, it is kind of offshoot road, but there are residences that didn't burn that are nearby that are occupied. So I think there could be some issues there. I'm sure all good points. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we are now at uh, 7.29. We started in on time with these meetings. Uh, if there are subjects that you would like brought up during our monthly staff presentations, please make sure that you uh, email me. It's, uh, it's important. Again, our goal now from uh, every single month, we want to make sure that we kind of give you an overview of everything that's happening from a recovery standpoint, from the county's perspective and, and our role. But again, we, uh, we want to definitely make sure that we uh, help facilitate this. You know, we, this is a marathon and not a sprint. We're in this for the long haul. So please mark down that uh, October 19th uh, uh, special town hall on transportation issues because I know that was a very important uh, issue that came up during these uh, coffee meetings. And the last one, we will have um, a coffee, last coffee at the r, &R Cafe this Friday uh, from 2 to 4. So please come on by. Uh, but after that, you know, we'll, we'll go back to business as usual. Uh, again, a lot of requests. If you have concerns, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it.